Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. I have 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, so we're gonna go ahead and get started here. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan, and I'd like to welcome you to a clearer view of the haze using NASA Jeff Disk data tools to examine the June 2020 Sahara Dust event over Barbados uh, webinar. First, what I'd like to do is just go over a few webinar logistics. To ensure the best audio experience, participants have been placed in silent mode. But if you have any issues or you have any questions, what I'd like for you to do is enter those into the Q&A pod, and you'll find that located on the right-hand side of your screen. This works like a chat. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted to our online Adobe Connect webinar catalog as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a few days of completion. And then once completed, I will send an email to all registrants with the recording link. As far as timing is concerned, today's webinar will be one hour long with 45 minutes allocated to the presentation and an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. Our speaker today is Dr. James Acker. He is a senior support scientist at the Goddard Earth Sciences Data and Information Services Center, or Jeff Disk, which is located at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. After our speaker has finished with his presentation, we will move to a final optional set of polling questions. Generally, we give these questions about three to four minutes or so, and then from there, we will transition to the question and answer period. Depending upon the volume of questions that are received, we will extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes from end time for those of you who may wish to stay on the line, but we will have a hard cutoff of 3.15 p.m. What I'd like to do next is pull up today's agenda. So this should be, you should see this in a moment here. Okay, Dr. Acker will begin today's webinar with an introduction to the justice. Next, he will provide an overview of the June 2020 Saharan dust outbreak and really showcase a variety of tools which enable users to visualize, analyze, and work with atmospheric data that can be used to study extreme dust events. Uh, during the Q&A session today, we will try to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. If we do not get to your question within the time that's allotted, we will have our speaker follow up with you offline after the webinar. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Acker. Dr. Acker and Jim, I will pull up your slides. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. You're very uh, welcome. I'm gonna point out something that we'll also mention at the end is for this webinar, we're also gonna try something new. Um, we have a forum that's been recently set up or several um, of the DAC. And in the Friday following this Friday, we're gonna have an open session on the forum to ask questions about the webinar for those people who may have watched the recorded version and didn't get a chance to ask questions or anybody viewing today if you have subsequent questions. And um, I should have a couple of dust experts as well as our own staff standing by to answer the questions on the forum. So thank you. Um, as Jennifer said, um, the title of the presentation is A Clearer View of the Haze, Utilizing NASA GS Disk Data Tools to Examine the June 2020 Sahara Dust Event over Barbados. In my background image here, you can see the dust, and um, I'll point out Barbados, which I do several times in this presentation, but Barbados is right here. And I'll tell you later why we're specifically emphasizing Barbados. Okay, now, a bit about the Goddard Earth Sciences Data and Information Services Center, the GS DISC for short. Um, the GS DISC is one of 12 NASA Distributed Active Archive Centers, or DACs. Um, the GS DISC is now responsible for the archive and distribution of data from several different NASA Earth observation satellite missions and instruments, as well as data generated by Earth system models related to the satellite data archive. Our specialty areas, our atmospheric chemistry, atmospheric dynamics, precipitation, and hydrology. And I left one out, but if we hit it again, we'll get there. Anyways, um, we are a certified trusted repository of our science data. We belong to several organizations, um, which you can see a couple of them on the top right of this slide. And we employ about 75 scientists, engineers, 
programmers and system administrators and management and support personnel for all of that. And if you don't know where we are, we're in Maryland. Um, I have a map, Google map, that shows GSFC, Goddard Space Flight Center, pointing out our square building and then an aerial picture on the right that shows where we're located. Okay? And if you've been to Washington and you know the Beltway, the roadway that goes around the city, we are quite close to that, as you can see in the picture. All right, now the event we're gonna talk about, which seems to have been almost forgotten in a couple months ago of history due to all the other um, cataclysms and disasters and weather events that have happened since, but this particular event was one of the largest Saharan dust outbreaks ever observed in decades crossing the Atlantic Ocean. And the dust hit an area when it crossed the Atlantic, islands in the Caribbean, northern South America, and parts of the U.S. Southeast and the Gulf Coast. And this dust was easy to see, or it made it things difficult to see, because it caused reduced and potentially hazardous air quality, and the skies became dim, the sun became very yellow, and visibility in many cases was significantly reduced. Perhaps not as bad as the smoke in California, but still quite noticeable. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to combine several of our DSDIS tools and services to demonstrate how they can be put together to look at the dust storm's effects on the atmosphere over the Caribbean island of Barbados. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing Barbados is that Barbados is the site of a dust monitoring platform which was deployed all the way back in 1966 by Dr. Joseph Prospero of the University of Miami. And um, I've spoken with Dr. Prospero, and he um, will probably be available to ask que answer questions next Friday in our Earth Data Forum. Okay, now what I'm going to do is look at Barbados because it's an ideal focus. We have this long, multi-decade record of dust being collected on the island, and now we can look at what's happening in the atmosphere <clears throat> when an event like the Sahara dust outbreak takes place. And what I'm gonna demonstrate, as was in the poll, our Giovanni system, and this is going to be shown in a way to explore the data that's available. The GSDisk data dashboard, the level two data subsetter, and the level three for regritter subsetter. And I want to emphasize, I am not going to fully exercise the capabilities of either subsetter. They are very good. They can do a lot of different things, and I invite you to explore them more. I'm going to look at four data variables the combined dark target and deep blue aerosol optical depth, or AOD, which comes from the MODIS instruments, relative humidity, the UV aerosol index, and the dust column mass density. Now, here's a couple of pictures um, showing what was going on in the Sahara in June. Um, the area was very stirred up. The image on the left, you can see uh, an image of June 7th. Um, and you can see dust was coming off the coast even then. And then, and this was visible several days, for several days. But the dust actually started to get moving on about June 16th. And Jennifer is going to switch over briefly. This image on the right is an animation frame, and we'll show an image, an animation right here. The false color you can see is called the dust score, and this helps track the dust as it comes across. And I'll rewind so you can see that again. So this is taken directly from the WorldView application that you can look at the data and get several images, which are also where I got my snapshots from. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. So we've seen the dust across the Atlantic. We can switch back to the presentation. Okay, now we'll talk just a little bit more about it. As we said, the storms formed over Africa in mid-June. The dust lifted into the atmosphere and was pushed across the Atlantic Ocean to impact South America, the Caribbean, and the United States. The main period of the dust over our region was June 25th through the 28th. Okay, now, according to FEMA meteorologist Michael Lowry, this was actually the most intense dust outbreak ever observed during the period when there were two moderate resolution imaging spectroradiometers with the MODIS instrument in orbit on the NASA Terra and Aqua satellites. 
And he provided a figure that gives an illustration of just how intense this was. Now, the data shown here is the maximum daily average for any day of the year between 2003 and 2020. And you can see that June, 20, June 20th, 2020, was significantly higher than any of these other previous maximum days. And this is for the region shown in the hemispheric map um, at the lower left in the figure. OK, so this is average over that entire area. And we know the dust moves. And I'm going to show you images from MODIS that show exactly how the dust moves. When the dust got to the Caribbean, it markedly reduced sunlight, incoming sunlight, and also caused potentially hazardous air quality for people breathing. OK, and here's a view from Barbados. Um, I'm not sure of the town it's over, but you can see that the sun was very dim, the dust was very thick. And again, why Barbados? Okay, here's a picture of Dr. Prospero's dust monitoring station, again, set up in 1966, and it's on a location called Ragged Point, which is on the southeastern coast of the island. You can see a picture of the, the point, um, nice and exposed. There's no in, in, industry near it, so it's sticking out over the ocean, and you can see where it's located on the map. Okay, so we're going to focus on Barbados as we do these analyses. Now, the first thing I'm going to talk about is Giovanni. I saw in the pre-presentation -pre poll that many people are used to Giovanni, so I'm just going to give you a very quick overview. Giovanni has a simple control board or interface. Um, you select a plot. You can see on the right that we have 22 different kinds of plots. I'll show just a couple today. Um, you can select a date range that defines your time period of interest. You can select the region of interest, both with a bounding box. You can type in lat long coordinates or draw it with a cursor or select from a multitude of different shape files. And then the last thing you would do is look for a data variable of interest. And we're going to start out with Giovanni looking at aerosol optical depth and looking at a couple others. So all you do is input these parameters, click plot data, and Giovanni goes to work. OK, now. This is the combined dark target <clears throat> and deep blue aerosol optical depth from MODIS. On the right is a sequence of four images. Now, these are daily mapped data. Now, because the instrument is a scanner, it scans a swath. The daily data only shows you the data that is in that swath. So you can see the heaviest AOD numbers, the highest numbers, where they were located on the 18th, the 20th, the 22nd, and the 24th of June. You can see the dust progressing over the Atlantic Ocean. Now, this is somewhat difficult to see because of all the gaps between the scanning slots. Okay, so one of the strongest things that Giovanni does is it averages the data. So rather than look at the single frames on the single day, this is an average between the 18th and the 24th. And this shows the track of the dust leaving the Sahara crossing over the islands, and reaching the Caribbean. See where Barbados is again. And you know, over the course of the time, the dust settled out, it spread out, and so the aerosol optical dust decreased from east to west. Now, the next thing I'm going to show is a cross-section plot. Now, the cross-section plot is for this region, and I did it for June 20th. Okay, now the cross-section plot is showing the altitude using pressure as its altitude variable and the latitude. So we're looking at the latitude and extent from here to here, and the altitude from 1,000 hectopascals, which is at the surface basically, up to 100 hectopascals. So the stratosphere is a little higher, but we're fairly high in the atmosphere. The dust is carried on something that many of you may have heard of. If not, it's called the Saharan air layer. Very dry, very hot layer of air that comes off the Sahara and pushes to the west. Okay, we can track this because it has a very low relative humidity, extremely dry air. So the cross-section plot, you can see the plot of relative humidity, shows where the Saharan air layer was located both latitudinally. You can see it was right about here on June 20th 
and altitudinally. You can see the altitude extending from about 700 hectopascals up to about 200 hectopascals. So it was fairly thick. I mean, so the dust was carried in this big layer of air in the middle of the atmosphere. You could do this for every single day. You can watch it as it arrives, as it disappears. Okay, now, the next visualization, very simple, Giovanni does this very well, is a time series. You know, the time series just basically takes the area, and I use this area in this map here, and averages all of the data for each time increment. So in this case, we're looking at daily data, okay? And so we can tell just pretty much exactly when the data got to this region, and that was on June 22nd and June 23rd. So the biggest mass of dust hit the region June 22nd and June 23rd, dropped off for a few days, and they're kind of a secondary surge a few days later. Again, I'm looking at the combined AOD from MODIS. Okay, so now you've seen, Giovanni has shown us timing. We have seen some variables we can look at, and we have also seen where the data was, what time it arrived. So we've really defined our region, our time period. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you to use now is the data dashboard. Okay, now as a preface, in order to use the data dashboard, you have to have an Earth data login. Most people that have downloaded data from our disk already have one. Very simple to register. You just need an email address. You have a username and password, and then you would click on login. You would be logged in. Okay. Once you've done that, the system will remember you um, by your Earth data login credential. Okay. So you don't have to do much else because once you've done it, you just go ahead, use the system, and it will record what your activity was. And this is just a couple of frames from some stuff that I was doing a few days ago. Uh, I was looking for information. I used a keyword search. This was looking for ammonia data from the cross-track infrared sounder. And this is looking for sulfur dioxide data from the ozone mapping and profiling study. Okay, now I like this, so I tagged it. So you can make your own tags. You don't have, they're not a preset. You can make up any tags you want and add them. And then based on that, you can come back and filter with your own tag and find just the data related to that. So that's a very simple introduction. Like I said, everything you do will be recorded is deletable. There's a trash can. So you can only keep, you can keep just what you want, you can filter it, and there's a couple other things I'll show in just a little bit. Okay, so we'll return back to this after I've shown how to use the level two data subcenter. Okay, now the level two data subcenter, the purpose of a level two data subcenter is to subset large volumes of data. The higher resolution of the level two data, which is we call satellite swath data. If you remember what the swath looked like map, now we're looking at the highest resolution as, as it is collected basically by the satellite. Not always in a scanning swath, but that's very common to the instruments that we have. Okay, because it's the highest spatial resolution data you can have, we can potentially have some quite high volumes. Okay, so first thing we'll do is we'll search. And in this case, I'm searching for the ozone measuring instrument, OMI, aerosol index. Okay. This is the result of my search. This is the first item in the list of things that the search covered. Okay, in order to get the level two subset, or you don't look for, oh, level two subset, all you do is click on subset, get data. And then you'll be using the level two subset. Okay, it even gives you a little note subset and download the data for this collection. Okay, now I'll take you step by step through what you'll see as you use the level two data subsetter. Okay, and the first thing you see is results. Okay, now we searched for this particular data collection and you'll see it's 3.72 gigabytes, quite a bit of data. Okay, but then you click on download method and you say get file subset using the GS disk data subsetter. Right. Here, when you specify that, you will then get options for this method, this, this subsetter method, okay? So the next step is to use these options. You can define the dates. You can type the dates into the begin date and end date or use the calendar and choose them at the same time. You can choose a region of interest. Similar to Giovanni, 
We don't have shape files in the level two subsetter, but you can type in your specific latitude longitude coordinates or just use the cursor to draw a bounding line. And then you can also go into the files and see. Now, many of these data products, if you haven't been familiar with them before, have many variables in a single data product. And this particular data product is one of them. There are a lot of them. I didn't show the whole list here because the ones I wanted were right at the top. So I specified I wanted the UV aerosol index, the visible aerosol index, and the aerosol optical thickness from the multi-wavelength map. So those are the only three variables I'm going to get in my variable subset. Last thing to do is choose data format, either an HDF or net CDF. I chose net CDF and then click to get data. And in a few seconds, the system performs the subsetting and provides this list of links. You can download them individually, or you can write scripts on whatever machine platform you're using to download them all at once. And there's a sanity check. If you click on selected parameters below the list, it shows you what your data set was, download method, date range, region, if I clicked here on variables, I'd see the variables. So all of that shows you, yes, this is the data I want. And we go back to the dashboard. Okay, and this shows what I just did, the data subset for that data collection, including the selection of the spatial format, temporal service, and variables. All of that's included. So I don't ever have to do it again. If for some reason I had a power outage, it would be saved. I come right back in, click on it, it's all there, does it again. Okay. The files themselves at the link are stored for two days. Come back later than that, you just have to redo the get data button and you'll get them again. If you really like what you did, you might use that criteria again, you can click the favorite button and then they become stored as favorite. And again, you can filter them. So I filtered them with OMI, that's the instrument <clears throat> that they came from. Excuse me. So now that we've done that, let's take a look at the data that we've got. So this is using a very useful and free NASA software package called Panoply. Um, you can download it. You can put it works on Macintosh, works on Windows, any type of system. Okay. And so what I did here was I first looked at a larger subset, put context on it, and this is from June 23rd. And here's the Lesser Antilles and Barbados is over here. And now I'm looking right here at our subset that I got from using the data subsetter. Okay, just the specific area that I that I looked at. Okay, and so you can see with the UV aerosol index that there's some variability. Okay, and our range shows that the range of color, and there's a little red spot there, I'll show zoomed in in a second, is between about 1.4 and about 3.6. Let's zoom in. And there's Barbados right there. Okay, and so no, in this particular time, and I, one thing I, you have to think about is this is a snapshot as the satellite went over. So the dust is drifting over, it's thick, it's thin, so this can vary throughout the day. Okay, but at this particular time, the aerosol index over Ragged Point, directly over Ragged Point, was lower than the central part of the island. You can see some, some you know, faint red over here. So this gives you a, a sense of what the spatial resolution of this highest level two data can do for you, okay? Because we're going to relate that, or a researcher can relate that to the dust being collected on the ground or taking an optical measurement from the ground, okay? What is the spatial variability over the eye? And you can see that you can get you know, quite a bit of variable, variability in a small area. Okay, now, we've looked at the UV aerosol index we might want to know how much dust is that. Okay, so what we're going to do now is look at the level three four regritter subsetter, and we're going to use level four data. Now, level three data, you take the level two data in the swap and you map it. That makes level three. Level four is generated by a model. So it's using satellite data and creating a model. The model we use, which we have a lot of data, is from the Modern Era Retrospective Analysis for Research and Applications version two called Mara 2. So I will do a very simple search, and I'll click Mara 2 dust, and invoke our search with the magnifying glass. Okay, and 
similar to what you see with the level two subsetter, I get search results. Okay, and if I want to search, you know, subset and get these, I click on subset get data, just like for the level two subsetter, that starts up the level three, four regritter subsetter. I will point out, I'm not going to show how it regrids, but you can change your output to match other types of data. And this is very important for other models. Other models may have a different spatial resolution, a different grid, a different map. And that's one of the very strong aspects of what the level three, four regritter subsetter does that I'm not going to show. We have a user manual. You can look through it. I think I even did a longer uh, video. It's available on our website and had help from colleagues who did that. So something else to look at. But here we're going to subset the data. Okay, you go through the same steps, but note <laughs> there's a lot of variables. Okay, Mera2 generates a ton of variables. That's just part of the list. Okay, I don't want all of those. I'm just going to get one, the, as I said, dust column mass density, which is nuke mass for short. Okay, so I've got my data. I went through the same steps that I did before, same period of time. I got back data files. This is what the model says that the dust storm looked like on June 23rd. Okay, so there was a big mass of dust. Remember on the time series, June 21st and 22nd was where it had passed over this part of the Caribbean. So you can see it's passed, it's gone past. The second surge is over here still to the east, okay. And then what Panoply can do, Giovanni can do this as well, is you can adjust the color scale. So I'm using this red and blue color scale, but I'm gonna adjust it so that I get white. There's a very small section in the middle of white. Okay, now that I've done that, okay, Barbados is hued in white. So that tells me that the value is right here on the stick mark about 0 0.00075 kilograms per square meter, which is also known as about three quarters of a gram per square meter. Now that means that in the atmosphere above Barbados, every square meter has about three quarters of a gram of dust. And I did a quick calculation, how much dust was over the entire island of Barbados according to this? And it's over 300 kilograms of dust, which doesn't sound like a lot until you take one kilogram of dust and throw it up in the air. And you tell me if that's a lot of dust. Okay, now, for a sanity check, I went back to Giovanni. Now, we're using the same data variables. These data variables are both also available in Giovanni, and I ran a time series. Now, the time series for Mera is actually hourly. So remember, I talked about earlier in the map, I was saying Air, OMI in the UV aerosol index gave me a snapshot. As the satellite went over Barbados, it took one book. Okay, now, here's a map, excuse me, time series of the dust column mass density for this entire period of time, okay? Remember, 21st, 22nd was when the highest dust, it's dissipated, it's gone to the west, but we can see that the value here between 0.005 and 0.001, I specified about 0.075, and that's what the model is telling us. So our map data that we put out corresponds with time series at the same time. Now remember, this is an average for the island of Barbados. You can see I used a shape file, my little header up here says it's the shape for Barbados. So this is specifically averaged over just the island of Barbados. Okay, and then the other thing I did was I did a time series of the UV aerosol index. Remember, this is a daily quantity averaged over that same area. Okay, and this hits that about a value of between 1.7 and 1.8. And if you remember the map, the range was from between about 1.4 and 3.6. So averaged for that day, over the entire island, the value is about 1.7. Okay, so we have verified that our spatial analysis using the subsetter and the highest resolution file pretty much matches up with the map data, and that's good. That, that means everything is nice and consistent. Now, why is that really good? Okay, because what we've done is if you do your data processing analysis, collect a lot of data, do each day, you can then potentially set up a correlation and get the best estimate of how much dust mass corresponds with the UV aerosol index. Okay, and so you can play that back and do your you know, best look at how much dust was over the entire island, or the entire Caribbean, or the state of Florida, wherever you want to look. And that's 
what gives us this capability of combining and synergizing all of our different data. And by doing so, we have thus given the research community a lot of different tools, okay, to explore the data and to utilize the data. And so, as I've shown before, we have a ground-based monitoring system been there since 1966. I found this in one of Dr. Prospero's earlier presentation. It shows the data monthly average. And note here, remember I said that there was about 300 kilograms over, over Barbados? Well, he's collecting micrograms of dust that actually come to the surface and get collected on the filter system that he's got. Okay, and so this is the monthly average of this. Okay, so you can relate this long-term record. You can look for change. You can sort of put this big, huge Saharan dust outbreak in June 2020 into perspective, into long-term perspective, okay? Because as we know, the dust contributes iron as a nutrient. It brings nutrients over and potentially fertilizes the rainforest. It may be carrying um, diseases and germs that affect coral reefs. Obviously, it has effects on the aerospace industry, flying an airplane, uh, and breathing. You know, it has an air quality impact. So there's a lot of different reasons that we want to look at the, both in the climate sense and in the human impact sense. So we have all of these particular things you can do with the data. And that's all I want to tell you. Um, I hope you enjoyed me letting show you an introduction to all of our different tools. And this goes back a little bit in history, but you know, we can look at wherever the wind blows. Actually, we can't look at Mars. But what we can see is that a dust storm on Mars, coming off the ice cap right here, has a lot of similarity to a particular dust storm that came off the Sahara Desert. And I'm pretty sure this is one of my historical CWIF images. And this was called the shark or hammerhead dust storm. And I believe this was even published in a few newspapers when it occurred. So. Wherever the winds blow, wherever the winds take you, we can be there to help you out. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jim. We finished a little bit early, but this allows additional time for questions. Um, so at this point, we are transitioning to the uh, optional final set of polling questions. We'll give these about uh, four minutes or so, and then from there, we'll transition to the question and answer period. We do have quite a few um, really good questions for you, Jim. So let's give these a few minutes. <laughs> I'll do my and best. Then, and then we will move forward with a Q&A period. All right, thanks everybody. Okay, let's give these questions just another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll transition to the question and answer period. So if you're interested in participating in the Q&A period, please stick around. Okay, everybody, with that, let's transition to our question and answer period. Um, really quickly before we get started, you should see in your lower right-hand corner of your screen that we have today's presentation has been is available for download. If you click on the second file, uh, the PDF labeled Justice Webinar September 2020, 
um, you'll be prompted with an option to download the file. And again, I will post the recording to our YouTube channel as well as to our um, Adobe Connect Earth Data Webinars catalog within a couple of days. I hope to have the post-processing completed tomorrow. With that, let's go ahead and jump into our question and answer period. I need to, we had a, a question earlier on, uh, Jim, and the question is, can you process the daily and the and the average using Python instead of Giovanni? So it was during um, the time, for, yes, when you had, you were going through the Giovanni um, screenshot. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you can you can download the data um, when when you do when you run a Giovanni session. The files that are used to create the visualization will be available for download. Okay, so for example, if you ran the animation, you would get a file for each day. Um, if you ran an average, you would actually be able to get download the files that went into that average. So you can get the data that way if you want it that way. Um, and obviously, you can apply Python to any of the data sets or data files that you download from using the level two or level three four um, subsetter. We have some, okay. I mean, it may not be specifically applicable, but we have some how-to documents that show you how to use Python uh, with our data. Yes, yes, and I did actually um, post the link to your how-to documentation. And for those recipes that include a Python tutorial, you'll see that indicated to the right with a little Jupyter notebook, um, right. you know, very small graphic um, just for identification purposes. The next question is, and I did answer this, but just to confirm with you, which product did you use in the WorldView animation? And I responded that you used the Dust Score layer. Dust Score layer, yes. Okay. Yeah, you so can see. The, I was going to say, you don't, I don't know all of them. Right. But there are many aerosol optical products available in WorldView as well. Okay. All right, so let me move on to the next question, um, which is more of a, a comment. Uh, this individual is looking, it may be too much to ask, but I wish for some data correction algorithm updated from rele relevant literature was also included in Giovanni, hopefully in the next few years. A lot of praise to the entire team. If you wanted to speak to that very quickly, that would be great. Just just briefly, one of the things that it, in a general DS disk sense that is happening um, over time, because it takes time to implement, is Giovanni is moving into a cloud environment. And when you move into a cloud environment, you can do many other ways of manipulating the data in the cloud. Okay, and so we don't even know exactly what's going to happen when we have a fully uh, impl implemented Giovanni in the cloud, but we know it's something that um, creates the capability of doing some very high volume, fast processing and implementing more algorithms on, on the data. So um, without being specific about what can be done, that capability is going to be there. So I would say keep watching what we're doing as we, as we migrate to the cloud. Okay, well, thank you, Jim. The next question uh, is, would you be able to say how many programmers are assigned to Giovanni development? <laughs> Not as many as you would think. Um, we, we went through a very strong development phase um, a few years ago, um, probably when we were switching over from Giovanni 3, the previous version, to Giovanni 4, we may have had a team of up to eight or 10 now it's a, it's a team of, of about four or five total um, because it's, it's moved into a maintenance phase. Now I will say some of our main effort um, where there are several programmers, I couldn't give you a number, is working on doing the Giovanni and the cloud migration. And we're putting a great deal of effort into that and um, as a good, good solid team doing that right now. Okay, thank you, Jim. Appreciate that input. The next question is, um, you know, a comment on using Panoply. It's a fantastic tool. Can we use it through command line on a Linux machine? I do not know. Um, the best way to find out is go to the NASA Panoply homepage, and course, if, if, there in, if the information isn't available there, correspond with um, the developer, who has always been very good about responding to questions. So um, 
that's where to take that up. We yeah, we like Panoply a lot. Um, you can you can do a lot with the data you get from Giovanni and put it into there. Um, I've had fun with it. I can do more things with it. Um, it has a good way of comparing data files, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Um, just really quickly, one of the participants is not able to see the, the presentation. Um, I can follow up and email you a copy of the slides that are available to download currently. Um, and then, of course, the recording will be available hopefully tomorrow, but if not, certainly by Friday around lunchtime. All right, the next question is, what is what is or are the best data set or data sets that can be used to separate the aerosol types, such as dust and smoke, for regions where frequently smoke and dust are present at the same time? <laughs> That's a really good question, and I will say right off the bat that I'm an oceanographer by, tra by training. So my specialty is not um, in the dust aerosol characteristics. I know that you will get different um, – well, right, let me go back a second. If you look at Merit2's output, Merit2 does differentiate between smoke and dust aerosols. I'm not sure their algorithm, but they have, they have both. I know that one of their data products, which I see frequently downloaded, is black carbon aerosols. Okay, so that's one way that you can look at it. Um, and then I think you have to get more algorithmically into the specific optical properties of the smoke aerosol as compared to the, um, the dust aerosols. As there, are several, there are absorbing aerosol products, um, and certainly smoke particles absorb light or reflect light differently than dust particles. So I will defer that, um, and I will point out, as I did earlier, that we're going to have a discussion on the forum next week, Friday. And the questions asked on the forum can be answered subsequent to that, but Friday we're going to try and have a rapid response to them. And that would be a great question to bring up there, and we can recruit several different of our staff members and our dust experts um, to talk yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah and so, Jim, I, I'm, I'm thinking um, that Colin Sefter's aerosol index pyrocumulonimbus product actually allows uh, one to distinguish between the dust and the smoke. Um, that is a data layer that's available on WorldView. If you World click on, yes. the, on the I icon, you can find more information about that. And I can type that into the, I'm not 100% certain, but I think that you, you would be able to distinguish. Um, okay, so there's a, a little bit of additional feedback there. Let's see here. Let's keep going here with the questions. Okay, the next question is, I've got aerosol data, data, gases and dust for four ground station sites in Trinidad, island, yeah, okay, uh, over 2000 to, 2015 to 2016, collected every six day for 24 hours. I'd like to evaluate my data matches against the satellite imagery for that time. Would like to test if it's practical and or accurate to use imagery for routine monitoring. Well, um, I will give an opinion that um, I couldn't specifically point to the science backing it up, but I don't think there's any reason that it couldn't be done that way. Um, certainly, you know, just to test it out, you could use Giovanni and you can look at what's available for specific days. Um, Giovanni has the MODIS aerosol products. It has the OMI aerosol products. Um, it, you're a little before TROPOMI. We actually have data from the TROPOMI instrument on one of the Sentinel satellites now. But yeah, I, I don't see any reason that you couldn't find the data corresponding to your collection time um, with any difficulty at all. So um, you can pursue that with us if you wanted to you know, point out specific methods. Um, you can ask our help desk, or again, you could ask the question in the forum next week as well. Um, that's a sufficient answer for now. Yes, I appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. And, and just a, a note regarding the upcoming event. Uh, we will have a short announcement posted to earthdata.nasa.gov, and I will promote that sort of Q&A session out through our NASA Earth Data Twitter and Facebook accounts as well, um, so you have information, okay? 
Um, so be looking is, is for there that. A place, oh, go ahead. Is there a place to type in the URL for the forum itself here? That they could sure. See? And is it is it forum.earthdata.nasa.gov? It is. That's all it is. Yeah. Okay. I'll do that now. And then we'll move on to our next question. All righty. All right, here you go, everybody. Okay, the next question is, will Calypso data be implemented and distributed through Giovanni? Um, probably not at, at this point. Um, we, we had actually been giving some information, I think a matchup data set to um, where Calypso data is from. I think it's the um, Langley, I wanna say Langley DAC. Is that the atmosphere? Yes. That's accurate. ASDC, Atmospheric Sciences Data Center. Yes. Um, it's, it's a little more difficult just because Calypso is primarily curtain, curtain you know, along the swath. And uh, we never had a great um, way of displaying that in Giovanni. Um, but, you know, you can talk with them about ways that could be combined. Okay, I'm just typing in the, there's additional atmospheric data as well and stratospheric data um, available at the Atmospheric Science Data Center. So I'm just going to type the link here um, into the pod, into the Q&A pod, if you'll give me just one moment so that you can explore. And let me data. add that, I'll add while she's doing that, that the ASDC is one of the participating DACs on the Earth Data Forum. They are actually the, the founding DAC and we have joined on with their effort. So um, they can be standing by as well for help with some of their data products. Okay, thank you, Jim. Okay, I'm just scanning the Q&A pod to determine whether or not there are additional questions. I don't see any additional questions at this point. I'll, I'll say, can I say one more thing? Of course. Um, I, I noted in our listing of, of participants that Dr. Prospero um, has um, graciously joined us, and I'm going to invite him to help out with any questions on dust transport over the Atlantic next week and any questions about the Barbados um, Tower. So, um, I, again, I thank him for, for helping me out. Um, a little bit earlier in, in the year, um, we, we had a short discussion. I mentioned I would be um, first doing an article, and then it turned into this webinar. So he was... A good inspiration. Um, we've known each other for a while, off and on, and so um, I hope he didn't mind me showing some of his um, figures in, in my study. And I, I really think it's you know not the only place they collect dust around the world, but it's a good long-term record that can really show um, how we can have these synergies um, that are really important these days when we have things like smoke and and dust and uh, various other events that are impinging on our on the air we breathe and try and see through. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Jim. Let's take a peek here. All right, does anybody else have any additional questions? If there are no additional questions, um, generally the, the way that the rest of this webinar uh, will go is that I will log off from the audio component of the webinar, but I'll leave the virtual meeting space open an additional 10 minutes or so. Um, so if anybody thinks of a question you would like to ask our speaker um, or a question that you would like follow-up um, for, please feel free to enter that into the Q&A pod. Um, that uh, question and answer log will be forwarded to our speaker. He will be able to follow up with you offline um, and moving down the road, if you have a question, you can feel free to email support at earthdata.nasa.gov, and those questions will be filtered to the appropriate um, NASA Earth Science Data Center. Um, all right, so let's see here. I don't know if Josh, you, is there a question I missed, Josh? I see one thing. I was looking at the question that related back, I think, to the data collection on Trinidad. Um, and you mentioned support at earthdata.nasa.gov. If he contacts through there, you can also refer him directly to our help desk, if that's necessary. Yes, which is longer. Is it helpdesk.earthdata.nasa.gov? 
I, I can't remember it offhand. <laughs> it's on our homepage. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll look that up and I'll I'll go ahead it's probably, and uh, it's probably paste the same that. Way. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and um, paste that into the question and answer uh, pod. Okay, thanks. All right, everybody. I don't see any additional questions. I really appreciate your participation today. Uh, we yeah, I want to thank everybody for attending. I hope you enjoyed it. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. At this point, we will log off from the audio component of the webinar, and I'll leave the virtual meeting space open. So if you're interested in downloading the presentation file, you could certainly do so below. Again, it's the second file that included the agenda, just for context, and then the presentation slide deck. All right. Thanks, everybody. We hope to see you at an upcoming webinar. Our next webinar um, will be held in October, and we'll focus on socioeconomic data services and tools. So information should be coming in the next few weeks on that particular event. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye, Jim. Thank you.